Quark tells an Andorian antenna joke. Dax moves Odo's furniture by three to four centimeters. And the legendary Brock Peters graces the sets of Deep Space Nine. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. Uh, we've also got very special guest, Melissa Longo, because it's a Nog episode. <laughs> and another very special guest, uh, Mr. Robert Hewitt Wolf, writer extraordinaire <laughs> and uh one of our favorite humans ever uh this is episode uh season four home front directed by david livingston written by iris stephen bear and what do you know robert hewitt wolf how you guys doing great i mean all things considered <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Doing great. I'm, I'm not yeah. i'm not sick you know and knock on wood so far yeah. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah. <laughs> she did it. <laughs> she did the knocking. All right, good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Covered. <laughs> so, you uh, know funny? Go, go for oh, it. Yeah. Go ahead. No, it's just going to, I was actually leading into what you were about to say. So go for it. Oh, perfect. Because you know what I'm about to say right now. Yeah. You're going to uh, say you like my shirt, right? <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Obviously. And, and besides me liking your shirt, I was going to say there was there were elements of this episode that actually remind me of the exact times we're living in right now, mm. and that was um, the fact that they were testing everybody to see if they were a changeling or not, and it made me think of obviously how we're going through COVID uh, testing for COVID. So I, I I know they're not they one doesn't have anything to do with the other, but it did remind me of. Uh, of that correlation there. It's really amazing. Like, and, and some of the same conversations that we have today, you know, themes, obviously we know the people and the things are different, but these are themes. And, uh, I think, uh, Robert, you said it best when we were, uh, reviewing, uh, shoot, what were those? The, the, the two parter with Gabriel Bell. Uh, past tense. Past one and yeah, two. Past <laughs> tense. One and two. When you said it's supposed to be, a warning, not a blueprint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <the> best. <laughs> I, I, yeah, this is another one of those <clears throat> sets of episodes that feels a little more uncomfortable uh, today. than Oh, look at that cat tail. That's pretty cool. <laughs> That's uh, the two butted cat <laughs> mochi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it just, yeah, it just, the, it, you don't really want these things to feel as resonant as they do sometimes. Although, honestly, I feel like this one was even more resonant right after 9-11. I mean, that, that's sort of wow, yeah. more about what it's about. Uh, although, obviously, as we're recording this yesterday, we just had a, an insurrection. <laughs> Watching it, yeah. <laughs> and attempted, right. arguably an attempted coup. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, you just write the stories. And unfortunately, sometimes they, they ring truer than others. Let's talk about it because I'll be honest with you. Um, when I was watching it, I didn't feel uncomfortable at all, but nothing makes me feel uncomfortable. I think I make other people feel uncomfortable <laughs> in general. Uh, but to me, when I was watching it, I was just like, I've seen it a bunch of times. You know, I love, I love rewatching Deep Space Nine, especially seasons four through seven. And still, to this day, I watched it and I saw it with whole new eyes, with a whole new appreciation. I mean, this man right here, I'm just, know, you know, yeah. I, I, it almost makes my eyes water just like when I think about having him, you know, I really mean it. It feels like he's gracing the set and Sirach can speak on that a lot more because he's told stories of when he came on it and Avery really came, stepped up to the plate for him and went to bat and said, look, you better treat this guy the same way you treat all of the legends that come, no matter how they look or no matter how you feel about them. And, you know, he's just like such an amazing presence. And it just made, it just filled me with joy and like warmth to see him there. And I love the character and he's a fun character. And one of my favorite lines he said, which is such a, a Joseph Sisko thing to do. And I felt like there, there's a lot of Joseph Sisko in Captain Sisko when he says, something about, you know, we have rights and that includes being as stubborn and thick headed as we want to be. And he says it with such like, uh, mm -hmm. I loved it. That's great. great. Anyway, uh, Srock, can you 
I don't know, talk to us a little bit about Mr. Brock Peters. Well, I mean, like you said, he's a legend and he paved the way for people like Avery, for people like myself. And clearly he's, you know, his talent is, is pretty much written all over this episode in the way mm-hmm. that he owns the character of Joseph Sisko. And, and, and what he provides for us is he, he turns Sisko back into a kid all over again. You can see the, the level of respect that he has for him, uh, like any child would have for their father. So I, I think it's interesting to see Sisko kind of reduced to a concerned child. Uh, when he's in the presence of uh, Brock Peters, I, I love that um, softness to to it. Yeah, I, I always love any of those scenes when Avery allowed his character to be vulnerable, and you know, because just a lot of beautiful, beautiful <laughs> moments came from that. And I think that the, the scenes with, with Brock, he definitely brought that that vulnerability, that concerned son, that, you know, you could see the love there too. And I, I thought it was, it was a lot of really, really sweet moments between the mm-hmm. two of them. Oh, and between he, all three of you, really. And he did the thing, yeah. he did the thing. I forgot that he'd done this. Again, like that's what's so great about Deep Space Nine is we're noticing new things every time. He did the thing that he does with Jake mm-hmm. Sisko that I love so much, he kissed him on the head. And uh, when I saw that, I was like, wow, I, I didn't know. I never, it never really resonated. But those were the little things that Avery does that really makes it such a personal. Anyway, there's so much to talk about with this episode. There's Brock, there's Nog and Jake back together as Melissa is showing. Uh, you know, there's, you know, the changelings are on, on Earth now. I mean, there's just, it, it's one of the best episodes, I think, because there's just so much to it. Robert, can you just walk us through a little bit like when you and Ira and the team were just kind of putting this together? By the way, this is January 1st, 1996 when this aired. So this was like five years ago. Yeah. Starting a new a new year. Uh, well, originally, I think we talked about this before in one of the other uh, interviews. Originally, this was supposed to be the season premiere of oh. season four uh, before, uh, before we just you know, had the discussions about adding Worf and decided that Worf would be the opening of the season. And then we would take some time to spend with Worf and sort of, um, um, you know, the Klingons and all that stuff. Uh, so, so we, we sort of pushed this idea back, uh, what 10 episodes. Um, but originally that was how we were going to open the season. We ended the previous season with changelings are everywhere. This is basically a direct follow up on that that there's changelings on earth and that uh, that there's essentially like a fifth column covert invasion of earth going on and they're starting to sabotage things and kill people and the ensuing panic and fear and, you know, reactionary, you know, uh, actions that the Federation or some Federation officers take were, were really supposed to be what the, what the first season, what the season opener was going to be. And then, so we pushed it back. Uh, we kept discussing it. You know, we, we were vaguely inspired by like, you know, uh, the businessman's who like, you know, the, the, the thing that, um, it was just an HBO series about it. The, this whole thing right before world war two, where right wingers tried to convince people in the, in the military to overthrow FDR, <laughs> you know, Really? Real? Yeah. And there was a movie that was sort of vaguely inspired by that. It was sort of a McCarthy area movie called Seven Days in May, I think it's called. It's sort of about a U.S. military coup. Um, or it can't happen here. Was, yeah. Anyway, uh, it's not, you know, it wasn't, it has been, it is something that people have portrayed dramatically about the United States. And we thought it was, would be interesting to play some of that stuff for the Federation. Um, mm. We were, that's what we're playing with. And, and I think we, we, we wanted to subvert expectations. Like the first half, it seems like it's all about the changeling threat, right? And then the real threat in part two is revealed. Which we'll 
talk about, I guess, when we get to part two. <laughs> yeah, no spoilers. I don't yeah. want to ruin it for Ciroc. Yeah. <laughs> I always get so excited when we have these really good episodes. I'm like, oh, Ciroc's going to love this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I did love this episode. I actually enjoy, I was telling Melissa earlier that I like the, the dynamic that Nog also brings when he's with Cisco. There's, there is another element between the two of them that is, is not anywhere else in the show. Um, where Cisco, you know, feels some sort of responsibility for Nog. Uh, he sees his ambition, he sees his desire. And he wants to help him, but he also is slightly annoyed by him. So I, <laughs> yeah, and a I little skeptical. Like a little skeptical, I feel like. Cisco is always a little skeptical of Nog. Right. Just because he knew Nog, you know, for three years before this stuff, you know. And, right. and Nog was not an exemplary, um, you know, didn't seem like he would be an exemplary Starfleet officer. So that it's that kind of like reluctant help and sort of mentorship in the face of like his skepticism too. It's fun. It's fun. You know, talking yeah. on that, by the way, just real quick, every once in a while, an actor will read a line in an interesting way. And it makes me think I would have read it differently, or I would have expected somebody to read it differently. And there was a line a couple times where, uh, for example, when when Nog says, "Hey, I was hoping to have a word with you," when Cisco is talking with Odo, and Cisco says, "Well, we were just about." The line is, you know, Nog says, "Hey, I was hoping, you know, if I could have a word with you, if that's okay." And, he, and the line is, "We were just about finished," right? Which I f- would have thought that on the page it means like, "Hey, we're just about finished," so sure. But the way he said it was, "We were just about finished." Like this is bad time. We're d- and it makes me wonder if you guys wrote it in that way, but then he, he, when he acts it out differently like that, it adds this other element that Sorok's talking about, which was like, it creates that little bit of tension in the scene where, which as we know, every scene must have some conflict. And he kind of makes this choice to, to add that to it. I honestly can't remember whether we gave that, uh, that line a parenthetical or not. Uh, <laughs> or that much thought or, or, <laughs> no well i i mean we, we put a fair amount of thought into every line i think but sure, i'm sure but i can't remember that specifically as being something that Avery played against the way we wrote it or towards the way we wrote it either either one is possible and i'm not i'm not when i say against i don't necessarily mean like wrongly like i'm just saying like actors read this scene and bring their themselves and their make choices to it and they make choices and that was a great choice mm-hmm. it, it, it's just this kind of moment not just that like this isn't the best timing but i'm in the middle of a lot of crazy stuff right now kid but also like i'm still not sold on you <laughs> you know there's still a little bit of that there right. and I, I think it's just a brilliant rock line reading he, he brings so much to it um and like i said we might have put in a parenthetical that says something like reluctantly or something like that but even that doesn't bring all that nuance that avery brings when he actually delivers it yeah well melissa we got to see nog in all of his glory how i mean it's just so cool when we see jake and nog back together. i mean it's great to see jake doing things and nog doing things but when they come together there's that magic right Mm-hmm. Just like peanut butter and jelly, back together again. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's great, and it's it's great to see them pick up where they left off, like a real friendship, somebody that you haven't seen for a long time, but you've been great friends most of your life, and you can just pick up where you left off, even though you haven't spoken to them or seen them in forever. So. You definitely get that feeling from their relationship, which is really great. I like that it felt yeah. too like it had grown. You know, I feel like that mm-hmm. the two of them acknowledged their their mutual growth. You yeah. know, they weren't they weren't the kids that we first saw hanging out together right. in like past progress. They, you know, mm-hmm. they, these were these were young men now, and that friendship was still there, but it sort of was on a different level, which I thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the I like the level of comfort when Nog first walks up and he says, "Yeah, I'm over here to get something to eat," and he actually sits in my chair when I got up to say <laughs> hi to him. 
<laughs> and it's like, that's what, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, you pull up another chair. I'm sitting here. And I, I just like that level of comfort that he that he took in that scene to kind of just make himself like, you know, I, I come here all the time and eat two worms. So I'm just as welcome as you guys. I'm part of the family. And and there was a moment there where it did feel like uh, like he's extended part of the family, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was great. It was kind of like Nog saying, what? I'm not visiting you. You're visiting my hood right now. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, You're this is where here. I hang out. I'm here, I'm here every night. <laughs> you guys yeah. are the guests. Yeah. That's, that's what I felt. Yeah. And I like that part. It was great. It was great. I mean, again, like, you know, Aaron just always brought so much energy and life to everything that he played um and to that character it's it's they're fun scenes you know and and honestly like i forgot how much of the episode was about the family stuff and about nog and all that i I, you know i remember the a story better than the b stories Mm -hmm. um and i I was it was interesting watching it again thinking like yeah we really put a lot of energy into this family stuff you know um probably more so than a lot of shows would do and I, but I think it plays off because it makes everything that's happening very personal. Yeah, there's that yeah. connection there that's I feel is a lot missing in a lot of TV shows that the relationship of different people and how they different differ between Nog and Cisco and Nog and Jake and um, and how they would differ. It, it just feels really honest and it, it's. It's fulfilling to watch because you don't feel like you're missing anything. If, you know. mm-hmm. Yeah, that's something we kind of talk about a lot on this show. It's about how other other series are about exploration or about this or that. But really, Deep Space Nine feels like it's about family and relationships. Mm-hmm. And that really stands out a lot more nowadays because maybe that happens less in television now. But really, like when we're going through this rewatch, I'm finding that to be the stuff that I'm really noticing more and more is yeah. Jake and Nog's relationship, Jake and his dad's relationship, you know, Cisco and the elder Cisco, Joseph. I mean, all of these things and like all of the, the friendships and the relationships and that's what makes it so special and and unique uh, beyond everything else. I think is, you know, did you guys, Robert, do you guys make like a concerted effort it seems almost like in every episode, you know, you go over, you know, you do passes for to improve the dialogue or you do. Did you ever do like passes to be like, let's make sure that we're, you know, adding to the relationships or let's make sure that there's a, a personal element or, you know what I mean? I, I think, yeah, I, I think that, I mean, that was Ira's big thing is always like, it's all about the people, right? It's mm-hmm. all about the relationships it's not about the tech or even this. I mean, the story was important to him is, I mean, story is still important to Ira, but I think he, he was very interested in those, those personal scenes, you know? Um, yeah. I'd forgotten the Dax bit with Odo, you know, which is a fun yeah. little bit. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, but it's thematic. We were trying to short, sort of set up the chaos versus order of it all. The, the sort of, um, Odo, you know, like some of the other characters that we meet, is very in- invested in things being safe and correct, and everything sh- it's in its place, you know. And Dax is much more comfortable with chaos and uncertainty, mm-hmm. in some somewhat the same way that Joseph mm-hmm. is a little bit more about living life and a lot less about worrying about you know security and things like that. It's like those aren't really his concerns. Like he. He's, he has a perspective that if you spend your life in fear and, and worry, then even with regard to his health, where it's not necessarily a good thing, but but that if you do that, you're not living your life. And mm-hmm. then what's the point? You know? And so that was the tension that set up by that. Um, but I would just love, like, even the, you know, we have that great Battle of Britain stuff with, with, uh, with uh, the fear and... Sure. Yeah, Brian at the beginning, which is just like, I mean, it's pretty goofball, you know, but it is, it is, 
it just speaks to relationship being sort of the center of the show, you know, relate the relationships being, being what we're really the most concerned about, mm -hmm. you know, story next. <laughs> so we got to take a break in just a second here, but I definitely want to talk a little bit more about that because I felt like that leads into kind of a, something that was a little bit more of a dead giveaway that this is a two parter for anybody that didn't know the first time they watched it. There's, I feel like there was a hint at the beginning there that this is a two part episode. Uh, so we'll talk about that uh, a little bit and then we'll talk a little bit more about Nog and Joseph Cisco, which I think were really the things that stood out to me the most. Um, and uh, we'll be right back on the seventh rule. 